Thank you, Seth, and good morning. Christ is risen. Good. I thought I'd hear that from you. Well, because it is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, I've decided to take a break from the book of Galatians, which we recently began, and I chose a passage from the book of Romans, Romans 8, verses 9 through 11, which is broad in its scope. It covers the whole of the Christian experience, really. It's written, of course, with a context, and it, the apostle earlier in the passage in verses 5 through 7 describes the life outside of Christ, prior to grace, prior to salvation. And he describes it as a life that is set on the flesh, a mind set on the flesh. Begins verse 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now in the lesson itself, I'm going to say something about that briefly, but it just there are some division among interpreters and in translations with this word spirit. The spirit is alive. Literally, it's the spirit is life. And so here the translators take this as the human spirit is alive. Others take it as the Holy Spirit is in us and he is life and the giver of life, the giver of Christ's life to us. And that's how I take it. So that's how I'm going to deal with this text. Uh, for, I'll give you a, a good translation of it that expresses my position. It's from the English Standard Version. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is life because of righteousness. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we do thank you for the blessings you give us. We thank you for this day, this Resurrection Sunday. Lord, every day for a believer in Jesus Christ is Resurrection Day. We live in the light of that great victory over death, that victory over the grave, but we historically celebrated on this day in a special way. And so, Lord, as we consider that, consider this great event in which your Son, through the power of the Spirit, at your will, was raised from the dead, conquered death. And we as your people, who have joined ourselves to him through faith, have his life and have that hope too. And so Lord, as we consider this text from the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, we pray that you would bless us, give us a, a good understanding of it and good reason to rejoice. Salvation is of the Lord and life is from you. You are the giver of life. You give life to the dead and you give existence to that which does not exist. And so, Father, we praise you and pray that our time together would bring great honor to you and, and encouragement to us. So bless us spiritually, build us up in the faith. And we pray, Lord, for our material needs as well. We pray that you would bless us materially according to your will, which is always best for us, not according to our desires, but what you desire for us. We pray for those of our congregation that are especially vulnerable, and we do that every week. We pray for Madeline Hargrove, pray for Audrey Harrell, pray for Margaret Smith. Lord, keep them safe during this, uh, this pandemic. And we thank you that it's uh, 
perhaps passing a bit and we're able to see more and more friends here. But we pray that you would protect, protect all of us for that matter. We pray for, um, for health, physical health. But we pray also for recovery for some of those that are. We think of Cindy Newman and as she continued to recover from her surgery. And we pray that you'd bless those who are still grieving following the loss of loved ones and pray for Lee and Rena and pray you'd bless them and encourage them. What a blessing it is to know as we consider this morning from our text that, that this life is not all there is, that the grave is not the end, that we have hope beyond that. We have the hope of the resurrection. And so Lord, may we May we think deeply on that. May we be encouraged deeply by it. So we look to you to bless. May everything we do this morning be to our encouragement. And may it be to your glory. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. There is an expression that is sometimes used to describe certain Christians. It is miserable sinner Christianity which might seem to suggest Christianity is a dreary religion. But for the Christian to understand who he or she is, they must realize that they are miserable sinners. And yet, when we read the Apostle Paul, we're not told to be miserable, but to be joyful. Rejoice always, he wrote. Again, I say rejoice. Well, how can a miserable sinner do that? Well, Paul could and did. He wrote those words to the Philippians while he was in a miserable Roman jail. In fact, we of all people, and, and only we, can rejoice. Not in ourselves, not in our circumstances, but in Christ alone. He alone is the reason for our hope and joy. And that reason is given by the Apostle in our passage this morning, Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones described this passage as three remarkable and most important verses. In them, Paul recounts the great blessing God has given every Christian from our past to our present and ultimately our future. Well, I'm especially interested in our future this Easter morning, the hope of the resurrection. Christ, our Savior, is alive. He is risen from the grave, and we, too, will rise someday. That is the hope every Christian has, and, and, and the reason for joy. But each of the three parts of this passage are remarkable and important and cause for joy. Our past is recalled in verse 9, where Paul reminds Christians that they are changed people. We're different from what we used to be. Paul's description of our past is a life in the flesh. He described that, as I pointed out in the reading of the text in the previous verses, verses 5 through 7. We were hostile toward God, didn't obey His law, weren't even able to do so. The New International Version translates the word flesh as sinful nature, which is simple and helpful and true, but Paul literally used the Greek word sarx, flesh. Why did he do that? It's because the sinful nature operates through the natural desires of the mind and body to powerfully, effectively distort them and use them, use the flesh, use the body to act contrary to the will of God. The rabbis spoke of the evil inclination, the term that they got from the book of Genesis. Because of Adam's sin and the fall of the human race, we are all born that way. We are born with this inclination, this sinful nature that rules our desires and it influences our behavior to produce lust, Greed, pride, other vices. Samuel Rutherford, the old Scot, called these sins tyrants. 
They are. Sin kills. And those in the flesh are under its authority, under its power. And it is a cruel dictator. It is a tyrant. But the believer in Christ is no longer in the flesh. God's grace has brought about a great change. Through God's grace, we've been born again. We are new creatures in Christ. Paul describes us now as in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, he describes the Spirit as being in us. In fact, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit at the moment of faith, and He is in us until the day of redemption. So think about that. When we were lost, when we were in the flesh, when we were in rebellion against God, we had no peace. Isaiah says that. There is no peace for the wicked. Now that's truly miserable. No peace. But we've been delivered. Do you realize that is who you are as a Christian? You have been freed. You have been liberated. You are under the guidance and the enablement of the Holy Spirit, not the enslaving passions of the flesh. By the grace of God, we have been born again with a new nature, a new heart, where the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, lives in us to enable us to experience and enjoy and exercise our freedom and live holy lives. So rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. That doesn't mean that life is easy. It's not. In fact, in many ways, when we are born again, the struggles really begin. We become aware of our condition. We become aware of our sin and, and, and the, the struggle that we have with it. But we're not alone. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us, and the Holy Spirit is in us. That is our present condition, and that's the encouragement that Paul gives in the next verse, verse 10. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now, as I said, there's a question here on the word spirit, the word pneuma, and I take it to be not the human spirit, but the Holy Spirit. And that's consistent with all of chapter 8, where that word pneuma is translated of the Holy Spirit. This is the great passage on the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And so the idea of this is Christ is present in the believer, in the Christian, through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gives Christ's life to us. Now there described as being in us who have mortal bodies. Bodies, Paul said, that are dead because of sin. And yet they occupy us. Christ, through the Holy Spirit, lives within us. And that is necessary because though we are forgiven, and every believer in Jesus Christ, every believer in the Son of God is completely forgiven forever at the moment of faith, nevertheless... We're still sinners. We still fail miserably. And the body is presently suffering the consequences of that. So while our soul is saved, sin remains in the body, resulting in decay and death. As a result, the Christian life is a battle. Paul described it earlier in chapter 7, verse 15, where he wrote, What? I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. You sense his frustration. That's our frustration. But then in addition, there is the, the body's decline and decay. <clears throat> we get old and fragile. It creeps up on us. Forty years ago, I used to run up the stairs. Now I walk. And it's, it's, it's not easy still. Also, part of the struggle we face is, is this. It's that very fact that that's the life we now live. This, this creeping age that we have. This decline of our health and our physical condition. That's life in a broken and fallen world. 
and it can be very discouraging. It is. And for many, it's despairing. They're losing everything they will ever have. And not the Christian. Not Paul. In fact, he wrote of this in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. But he said, we do not lose heart. And the reason is, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Renewing our inner person, in increasing its vitality and purity. So as the outer self shrinks, the inner self grows. And grows in its sense of eternity and of its immortality. That caused Paul to rejoice and put life's trials for him in proper perspective. He could then call them momentary light afflictions. And if you read 2 Corinthians 11, where he gives a, kind of a catalog of the things that he suffered as an apostle, you would say those aren't momentary light afflictions, but he considered them that, stonings and beatings and shipwrecks. Consider them momentary and light because they're pr producing, as he said, an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Whatever you may suffer in this life, and some of you have suffered a great deal in this life, but whether you suffer from physical hardship like sickness or the, the trials that come with opposition for your faith, persecution for it, or just to the personal struggle that we all have with sin, the fight, fought well, will result in reward. Great eternal glory. So Paul later wrote in Romans 8 verse 37 that we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us, through Christ who died for us and lives within us. In the present, though, the Christian is a warrior. We're in the arena, fighting the good fight of faith. Most of what we do is unseen by others. It goes on within ourselves, in our mind. That's where so much of the battle is fought. So you don't see what I'm going through. I don't see what you're going through. But God sees it all. And He gives strength, and He'll give victory, and glory to come. So today we wage war spiritual war. But the fight will come to an end. It will end victoriously. So, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, that eternal weight of glory that Paul spoke of is what verse 11 is all about. And here is why we don't despair, even though we are presently dying. Death is not our ultimate destiny. Life is. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That's our hope. The struggle will end the body will be redeemed, resurrected. We are bound for glory. And the, the assurance of that is the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> He's within us. As I said in Ephesians 1 verse 13, we're described as being sealed with the Spirit. He is the pledge of our future glory. It was by the Spirit's agency that the, the Father, God the Father, raised God the Son from the dead and by the Holy Spirit, He will raise us, not resuscitate us, not restore us to our old life, but transform us into Christ's likeness and glory. Then our salvation will be complete. We'll be saved body and soul, and we will be fit for the world to come the regenerated world, that's how, Paul, that's how rather the Lord describes it in Matthew 19, verse 28. A regenerated world, the kingdom to come, and then beyond that for all eternity. The new heavens and the new earth. That's our future for all eternity. World without end. 
Think of that. We will be fully liberated from all weakness, pain, and sorrow. And then we will be truly free. Free from the penalty of sin, of which the believer is free now. Free from the power of sin. That's our condition today. The power of sin has been broken. We still sin, but we're not under the rule of it. And free from the presence of sin and its effects. That's our future. No more indwelling sin. We will be raised to perfection. Bodies buried millennia ago that have long since dissolved into the ground. Those lost at sea whose bodies disappeared on the bottom of the deep. God will raise them all whole and complete. That's what Christ gained for us through His resurrection. Through faith, we joined ourselves to Him. And in joining ourselves to Him, we joined ourselves to His death, which obtained atonement, salvation for us, and we joined ourselves to His life. He is alive. We have a living Savior. So we too will be raised to life forever. Now that should occupy our thoughts daily. It's what gave Paul confidence and joy during the, the hardships of life. It, it, it frames our outlook. It gives us perspective. And it gives us, with that perspective, the desire and the courage to live well, to live boldly in this world. It's our hope, as I said. But it, it's a hope that seems absolutely impossible to people. How can God raise bodies that no longer exist? The Romans thought that was impossible. Ancient historian Eusebius gave uh, an account of their persecution of the Christians in Lyon, France. The Romans would burn the bodies of the martyrs and then they would take the ashes and they'd scatter them on the Rhone River in order to destroy the Christians' hope of rising again and with the thought of frustrating God's power. Now that's the thinking of the world. That's the foolishness of unbelief. And it is thinking of God as though He were a man, like us. As though God Almighty cannot account for all of the atoms of His saints, of His loved ones. Now think for a moment in the opposite direction, from, from the smallest to the greatest. Think of the vast universe. There's nothing bigger than the universe billions of galaxies and trillions of stars. Scientists haven't found the end of it. The more they search it, the bigger it gets. J.I. Packer wrote in his book, Knowing God, our minds reel, our imaginations cannot grasp it. When we try to conceive of the unfathomable depths of outer space, we are left mentally numb and dizzy. But what is this to God, he asked. Well, of course, it's nothing to Him who is infinite. As great and vast as the cosmos is, it's limited. God is not. And so, this vast universe is like a speck, just a speck to the infinite God. The prophet Isaiah knew that and spoke of the Lord in these very terms in chapter 40. One of the great chapters of the Bible. One of my favorite chapters. If you want to get a sense of the greatness of God, read Isaiah chapter 40. And in verse 26 of that prophecy, he described the Lord as the one who created the stars. And He is the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name. And it's a significance in that idea of calling them by name. In the Bible you see this, and in the ancient world it was believed that to know the name of something is to control that person or that thing. And he calls them out all by name. Isaiah was using a, a military metaphor. The stars are like a great army, a host, that God brings out at night onto the plain of heaven just as a, a general would lead out his army onto the field of battle. He directs the course of every one of them. Trillions upon trillions. Numbers 
that uh, are beyond our calculation. And Isaiah said, not one of them is missing. Well, how can that be? Well, it can be because God is not small. The problem that the world has, the problem that even Christians have, is their God is too small. Well, we're limited in our thinking, but God is unlimited. He is infinite. That's how He can do that. And inversely, not one atom, one molecule of one of His saints, of one of His people, is missing. He can account for every one of them and bring them out of the dust, up from the sea, out of the ashes at the resurrection. He's all-knowing, He's all-powerful, He's unlimited, He's unhindered. Nothing is too difficult for Him. That statement, nothing is too difficult for Him, comes out of the book of Genesis. It's when in chapter 18 and verse 14, He's told Abraham that He will have a son. And Abraham has longed for a son for a long time. He's bad, at this time, he's 99 and Sarah is 90 and well past the age of bearing children. And she's hiding in the tent and she laughs when she hears that. She laughs with unbelief. And the Lord said, is anything too difficult for me? Anything too difficult for the Lord? That can also be translated as anything too wonderful for Him. In other words, no, there's not. In fact, Paul draws upon that, that incident in Romans 4 and verse 17, and he describes God in this way, the one who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. That's how great God is. He overcomes death. He gives life to the dead and He calls into being that which doesn't exist. Non-existence is not even a problem for the Lord God. Nothing's too difficult for Him. The resurrection and glorification of His children, every believer in every age, is an absolute certainty. And we know that because God's Word promises it. And we have the Holy Spirit within us as the guarantee of that and as the one who gives us the confirmation internally that that is true. We will be raised whole and glorious like Christ. But will we be recognizable? Will we recognize one another? That's a, a question that's often asked. You wonder, is it going to be like my 50th high school reunion where I didn't recognize anybody and they didn't recognize me. Fortunately, we had little name tags with pictures. That's what I used to look like. <laughs> well, will it be like that? No. No, it, it will be glorious, not difficult because of age. We will be glorious, and yes, we will recognize one another. One of the reasons I say that, biblically, is from... The transfiguration. You will remember it when Jesus was on the mountain with His disciples, Peter, James, and John. He was transformed into glory. It was as though the veil of His flesh was removed and they got a peek into who was really there and this glory shines like, like the sunlight. In fact, like the sun at noon, brighter than that. And they recognized Him. They knew who He was. But then He's joined by Moses and Elijah who were talking to the Lord. And the disciples recognized Moses and Elijah. Christ and those prophets kept their identity. So will we. There'll be no confusion because of the resurrection. In fact, just the opposite. There'll only be clarity. The difference will be that we will all be healthy, we'll be whole, and glorious. Uh, it will be our bodies only glorified without any defect. Or as Paul put it in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, this body will be transformed from its humble state into conformity with the body of Christ's glory. That's our destiny. The hope of that made the trials of life for the Apostle Paul seem small, just momentary light afflictions. And they should do that for us as well. They should cause us, that should cause us 
to rejoice. Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield wrote an article over a hundred years ago about miserable sinner Christianity. And he said, there is this attitude, a continued sense of sinfulness. We have that. A sense of sinfulness in fact and in act. We, we still fail. And it's humbling and discouraging. It's what Paul expressed in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. As he comes to the end of that conflict that he speaks of in the chapter, he says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Our sin and failure are, are the source of continued sadness and repentance. But that is not all. That's not even the main thing. In fact, Warfield said that the main attitude of the Christian is not even one of hope. It's more than that. He said it's an attitude of exultant joy. We're sinners, lost and helpless in and of ourselves, but we are saved sinners. And it's our salvation that gives what Warfield called tone to our life. As we think about it, we have reason for exultant joy. In the past, we were freed from the tyranny of sin. In the present, we have the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit with us through all of life's struggles. And in the future, our mortal bodies will be resurrected, glorified. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us. So, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. But again, as I said at the beginning, you can rejoice only as a believer in Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith in Him? It's all one must do. Recognize your guilt and trust in Him. He has done everything for us. He declared it on the cross. He said, it is finished. He bore our sins and God is absolutely satisfied with what His Son accomplished. In fact, that's the reason for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the reason for the Easter celebration. Paul explained that earlier in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, where he stated that God delivered over His Son to the cross because of our transgressions. And He raised Him up because of our justification. That is because our justification was accomplished and, and secured for us. And so He raised Him up. Christ took our place in judgment, the judgment we deserved. He bore our sins. He died on the cross as our substitute. And His sacrifice was accepted by God. God's justice has been fully satisfied and His righteous wrath completely exhausted in Christ for all who believe in Him. Everything necessary for our justification, everything necessary for our salvation occurred at the cross. The cross is the victory. The resurrection is the confirmation of that. God raised His Son from the dead as proof that He accepted His sacrifice for us. The resurrection, as it's often said, is God's amen to Christ's it is finished. That means there's nothing for us to do but realize, one, that we're sinners, miserable sinners for sure, and then receive God's forgiveness. Receive the life that He gives, the hope of the resurrection, and receive that through faith alone in Christ alone. There's nothing more we can do than that. And that's all He invites us to do. Receive Him through faith. If you have not believed in Christ as God's eternal Son and our only Savior, may God help you to see your need and bring you to faith in Him. And may help all of us who have put our faith in Him to rejoice. We have every reason to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for the hope we have as believers in Christ that this life that is passing so quickly 
and that is so full of difficulty. It's this body of death that we have that is in decline constantly. That this isn't the end. That we have hope beyond the grave. That we have hope for all eternity. And it's what Christ obtained for us on the cross. And you accepted his sacrifice for us and demonstrated that through the resurrection, which we ourselves will experience someday. We give you thanks for that. We rejoice in that. And so, Father, we pray that you would now bless us as we uh, continue our service and uh, pray that we would worship you well in this time of remembering the Lord at the Lord's Supper. We look to you to bless and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So in pre preparation for the Lord's Supper, let's sing, I think it's hymn 41, is that? That's correct. Let's stand and sing hymn number 41. As a young boy, my mom would summon me to the table. And when I came, she would say, did you wash your hands? And having the fallen nature that I did, I would often say, yeah, sure. <laughs> but she was aware of that fallen nature because she always wanted to do an inspection and I would be found not able to weigh out on the scales of justice. I was lacking, I was wanting. She would say, you can't come to my table unless your hands are clean. Now David says something very similar to that in Psalm 24, doesn't he? And this is what he says. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to what is false. And does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. New Testament references in the Old Testament. Righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God the God of Jacob. To properly understand what David is saying, we need to start at the end of this text and work our way back to the front of it. There is a generation, Mr. Spurgeon said, it was a regeneration who seek after God. They seek because we read in verse 5, they have received a great blessing. They have, we read, received righteousness unto salvation. It is a gift. So they neither merited or earned or deserved it. This gift is twofold. First, the recipients of this gift, this blessing, recognize that their hands are not clean. They recognize that their hearts are not pure. They recognize that they are idol factories. And they recognize that they would just as soon lie as tell the truth. By the grace of God, they have been made aware of their sin and their unworthiness. 
secondly, and again by the grace of God, they recognized Jesus Christ, the Son of God who became perfect man. They recognize who he is and what he has done and that he has done it for them. Furthermore, they recognize that his hands are clean. His outer holiness. The Lord Jesus went about doing good. They recognize that his heart is pure. In the Sermon on the Mount, he would say, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. There were no idols in the life of the Lord Jesus. And he could not lie. He was not able to lie. He did not because he could not. Understanding our sin and unworthiness and properly esteeming who Christ is and what he has done for us grants us ascension on high. Entrance into his presence and proper standing at this table. And much, much more. Forgiveness of, his sin, of our sins and eternal life. All because of his great atoning work at Calvary. Mr. Spurgeon adds some clarity. It is possible that you are saying, I shall never enter into the presence of God to enter his heaven or sit at the table, for I have neither clean hands nor a pure heart. Look then to Christ, who has already climbed the holy hill. He's entered as the forerunner of those who trust him. Follow in his footsteps and repose upon his merit. He rides triumphantly into heaven, and you shall ride there too if you trust him. So by the grace, the unmerited favor of God, we climb the hill, we come into the presence of the Almighty God, into this Lord's table, not in our merit, for we have none, but in the merit of Jesus Christ. Let me give thanks for the bread. Our Father, the salvation, this salvation that was purchased, this righteousness that has been imputed to regenerate the souls of your elect, your chosen, has come at dreadful even infinite cost to thee. One of the greatest pictures in the scriptures of this truth is found two psalms behind the one that we cited. Again, a psalm of David. A psalm of David, but not a psalm, a psalm about David. It's been called the psalm of the cross. A prophecy written a thousand years before the Romans adopted this heinous form of execution called crucifixion. It speaks of a violent death. It speaks of great physical suffering. Of a body bruised. And Isaiah tells us an appearance that was so marred, it was more than any man. It speaks of his hands and feet being pierced. It speaks of humiliation and rejection. The shedding of his blood. And most significantly, it speaks of a time when you 
poured out your righteous wrath on him that was justly due to us. He became our substitute, absorbing the wrath that we so richly deserved. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. Lastly, it speaks of his work being finished, complete, lacking in nothing, acceptable to you as evidenced by the resurrection itself. Lord, we thank you for this, blatant, this great plan of salvation unfolded in eternity past for a particular people who neither sought you or deserved the blessings of forgiveness and eternal life. The one in whom's merit that we come said, do ye this, eat this bread and drink this cup in remembrance of me. So as we do so this morning, we pray that it would be done in a thoughtful, honoring, and worthy way for his sake. Amen. I will read from John chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. The passage I will read happens in Jerusalem around the Passover. Jesus had just cleansed the temple from the money changers and those selling animals. This was an act, was a manifestation of divine judgment. Then the Jews asked for a sign, and Jesus answered in verse 19, and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. And will you reel it up or raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So he referred to his death on the cross and that he would be risen up after three days, removing the divine judgment from his people and the elect. He is the true temple. Later, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he said in the book of John, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. His perfect work on earth, given to him by the Father, had been completed once and for all. After three days, he was resurrected. All sins paid for, and we were redeemed. God loved his people with an unconditional love. And we know from the book of John also, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We have so much to be thankful for. The only thing we can do is to bow down and praise him and thank him and remember him and what he has done as he asks us to do. So let's give thanks for the wine. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, it is with great humbleness, joy and hope we come before you this morning, praising you that we come, can come before you directly into your presence through your Son, and through his blood. We praise you for your mercy and love and the glory of your grace in which you have made us accepted in the beloved. 
We are grateful and we look forward to the day you will return and bring us into your kingdom. And your voice will be heard. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Dear Lord, teach us your wisdom. Help us to be watchful, to resist evil through faith in you. And make us always remember and trust that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We pray now that we will be able to take the wine in a worthy manner. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Let me close us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, creator of heavens and earth, we thank you for this Easter service this morning where we freely can come before you remembering what your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, have done on the cross for us. We pray that you will be with us today and always. Keep us safe as we leave here and drive to our homes, dear Father. Know unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God and Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, but no one ever. Amen. That concludes the service. Have a wonderful Easter Sunday. Thank you.